Ace Combat 4 Shattered Skies is the first game in the so-called Holy Trinity of Ace Combat games. I've been hearing the tale of this Holy Trinity pretty much since I've started my journey of getting into these games. And now that it was finally time to find out whether or not the hype was actually warranted, I couldn't wait to get into it. But if you want to see me struggling to play the first three games in the series, feel free to check out my previous video. And for everybody else, welcome to my experience with Ace Combat 4. I hope you enjoy. Ace Combat 4 opens up with a fairly lengthy, I'm gonna call this cutscene for now, which I personally found to be the best intro to any of the games so far. Just based on this intro alone, it was immediately clear to me that this game was going to somewhat continue in the footsteps of AC3, where the story and the world building was much more prevalent than in the earlier entries in the series. Based on what the narrator tells us in this cutscene, the game takes place sometime after a continental war broke out because of some cannon that one of the countries had built. It would take me a while to find out why this weapon was so special that it could start a war by just existing, but the cutscenes would provide me with a drip feed of information all throughout my playthrough. At first I thought that I was going to play as this kid, which was very prominently featured in all the cutscenes, with the narrator being me as an adult, and these cutscenes being glimpses of how I grew up to become the ace pilot that I am. But I realized fairly quickly that this theory doesn't really make much sense, as I started to take on missions as someone by the call sign of Mobius One, who really is a nobody in the grand scheme of things. Well, at least at the start of the game. Ace Combat 4 has a total of 18 missions. All of these are given to you in a single linear story path, which shows the willingness of the devs to completely change the structure of the series yet again. Ace Combat 3 had the sprawling story and world with different branching paths and secret missions, while AC4 just kind of presents you most of the things it has to offer in one go. But I honestly didn't really mind this, as I was also really looking forward to the generational leap, which would hopefully give this game a more polished and fun gameplay loop. Yes, so this is the first PlayStation 2 game of the series, and man, did it deliver. As I jumped into the very first mission, I was immediately back in the groove of things, doing all my usual flying maneuvers and shooting missiles at my targets. But to my surprise, the game actually felt a lot nicer to play than the previous ones. And with the Super Ultra HD aircraft, well, at least as much as the PS2 allowed them to be, the whole experience seemed a lot closer to the footage that made me want to play this game series in the first place. It looks like they somehow spoofed our identification system by hacking about half of the entire satellite array that we possess. Also, Jeff Bezos is sending nuclear missiles to whack your ass. Please move. I basically saw some crazy Ace Combat 7 stuff, and I just knew that I had to play this at some point. Anyways, after my first successful mission in AC4, I was greeted with yet another cutscene. Whose kill was that? Make sure to thank him. That was me. All of them. We have so many people here. Why, why did no one else hit them? The war seemed to unfold in the blink of an eye. I don't remember exactly when the forces from the west occupied my town. I was too busy scanning the skies day after day, waiting for Yellow 13 to reappear. Is Yellow 13 the nine ball of this game? Ace Combat 4 storytelling is split up into two different ways. On the one hand, you get details about everything that is happening through the mission briefings, which update you on the state of the war and generally keep you in the loop of things. But on the other hand, you also get to witness the war from the perspective of a child in the interlude cutscenes. Suffering through hardships while also giving you the backstory of what you could call the main villain of the game, or I guess rival would be a more accurate way to describe him. Also, I'm not talking about the kid itself, this right here is our rival, but we will get to him a little bit later. I actually really ended up liking this kind of dual narrative, even compared to AC3's giant web of branching story paths. There was just something intimate about it, which really resonated with me. But I don't want to get ahead of myself here. Why don't we actually talk about the gaming, shall we? Mission number 2 of 18 had me take out some enemy bombers, before they could even become a threat to our forces. 
To achieve this, I had to fly along some power lines, which would eventually lead me to my target. I also had to face some resistance, of course, but it wasn't nearly as much as one would expect for a base very close to the front lines. And like I said, I was right back in the groove of things. Flying my aircraft felt better than ever, and I was able to apply all the lessons I had learned from the previous games. As I made contact with the still-grounded enemy bombers, I started to experiment with my secondary weapon option. Yes, even my basic starter plane had some special air-to-ground bombs, which weren't all that easy to use, but this mission gave me the perfect opportunity to get the hang of these bad boys. After struggling to hit some, uh, stationary targets, I just went back to my trusty old missiles and blew up the remaining bombers. With my second assignment now completed, I was rewarded with yet another cutscene. Not every mission is capped off by one of these, which is unfortunate, but this perhaps made me enjoy them even more when they did actually show up, despite it basically just being some narration accompanied by a slideshow. Mission number three had me and some squad mates take out a radar facility in the snowy mountains, which was a nice change of scenery. And speaking of which, the environments in this game are... Uh, f fine? <laughs> I don't really have any strong feelings towards them in either direction. Most of the visual attention has been given to the actual aircraft, with the PS2's processing power being dedicated to render them as lifelike as possible. And this decision obviously makes sense, as they are the most important aspect of this whole experience. But as you will see later, that didn't mean that they forgot to use the environments in some interesting ways in the following missions. What actually made this mission somewhat special, however, is that they introduced a resupply mechanic after taking out all of the radar facilities. Take vector 180 south. 118... how do I see? 1180? One, 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 okay, I'm just flying into the direction my friends are flying. Use the return line on the map to exit combat area and return to base. Fly in the right direction and you'll see a white dotted line across your flight path. Oh, don't do this to me, game. Don't... okay. Oh. We did it! <laughs> I didn't know it at the time, but the resupply mechanic was going to become vital in my success during some of the missions in the later stages of the game. Mission 4, however, was not that. It was pretty straightforward. I just took out some enemy radar jamming planes without too much trouble. And up until now, I had been flying my basic F-4 fighter jet, but thanks to all of my recent achievements, I had saved up a decent sum to buy a big and beautiful F-16. I think I'm starting to get why people are into these games. Anyways, as I took my new shiny toy into mission number 5, I was greeted with the first of many score-based missions. I say first of many, because these things are kind of the staple for AC4. To give you the basic rundown of how these work, I need to show you this diagram. Pretty self-explanatory, right? Take out the fighters first. What do you mean? I'm I'm destroying innocent civilians. That's way more fun. <laughs> well, we're gonna be in here ten minutes anyways. So uh, might as well have fun with it. This game might have accidentally turned me into a psycho. Or maybe I already had some tendencies before that? On a more serious note, the goal of this mission was very simple. Destroy as much of our enemy's stuff as possible to receive a better rating at the end. Oh yeah, this game has rankings for the missions, by the way. The fail condition here would be either getting shot down or not being able to amass the minimum amount of points displayed at the top left of the screen. Like I've said, this mission objective is very prevalent in this game. So much so that about half of the game's missions can be counted towards this type. This is also where the resupply mechanic will come in handy. But before I was able to call it a day after taking out enough targets in mission 5, it had one last trick up its sleeve. <laughs> Oh no, wait, I'm out of missiles. Um... I was getting ambushed by the Yellow Squadron. Our enemy's ace pilots, who are led by the elusive Yellow 13 I've been hearing about during the intermission cutscenes. Even though it was only five aircraft that I was up against, I very quickly learned that their teamwork and piloting skills were vastly superior to ours. So the only option we had to come back alive from this mission was putting on the afterburner and racing back to the supply line as fast as possible. After coming pretty close to being shot down by the Elite Yellow Squadron, I took on another pretty straightforward points-based mission. 
At this point, I was a lot more comfortable with using the unguided bombs I was talking about earlier, so I was able to completely tear up the actually pretty cool urban environment I was flying through. 15 minutes later, and over 3000 points to my name, I completed mission number 6 without any issues. How are you guys liking my gameplay? Is it completely infuriating to watch? Probably. Mission complete. All aircraft. RTB. Let's go. Ooh, cutscene. Okay, that was cool. <laughs> Emboldened by the singing of my comrades, I dove headfirst into the next assignment, which had me destroy some power plants fairly deep into the enemy's territory. This mission was fittingly named Deep Strike and looked to be another routine task for me and my squadron. But it ended up turning into an absolutely hellish battlefield after achieving our primary objective. Oh, below 2,000 feet. Not a dynamic canyon mission. Oh, please. Oh, there's someone. How did I keep that under control? No. Ace pilot right here, baby. You will never see me crash. Next mission is where I crash. You will never see me crash. What I had just witnessed was the terrifying power of an erosion superweapon named Stonehenge. It utilizes multiple long distance rail cannons to take out any airborne targets above a certain altitude, which is what we saw happening during this mission. And I also think that it is very apparent that this thing is a huge threat to our chances of winning this war. As such, Stonehenge and how to deal with it becomes the main plot point for the next couple of missions. Let's go. Oh, Shattered Skies, that's the name of the game. All right, I know what you guys actually clicked on this video for. I think that I've been teasing you long enough. So let's get into Uppercase T's Ace Combat Series original soundtrack review. Yeah, the title is a bit long, so I'm gonna have to rework that. Okay, the music is, is rocking. I'm rocking with the music. I'm liking the soundtrack probably more than AC3's. During the mission Shattered Skies, I just ended up vibing while taking out threats to one of our rockets carrying a recon satellite. Ace Combat 4's OST does have some standout tracks, but I can sum up most of them too. I was just vibing. The general direction and feel of most of the songs was fairly different from most of the older games, but not necessarily in a bad way. I still think that I prefer Ace Combat 2's OST simply because it just really got me turned with pretty much every single track, but this one here definitely ranks pretty highly on my tier list. And now I've gotten bored of going through every mission individually, so why don't we just go through them a little more quickly. Mission number 9 is at about the halfway point of the game and many of the remaining ones are A. Score based and B. Very long. So I'm just gonna rapid fire through some of these and then catch you all up on the state of the warp afterwards, alright? Uh, great. You have no say in this by the way. Operation Bunker Shot is a large-scale attack meant to establish a foothold closer to the enemy, while decimating as many of the erosion forces as we could. Another score-based mission, which was mainly focused on ground forces, with some aircraft joining the fight later on after most of the damage had already been done. Oh. The Tango Line is a defensive barrier on the Yusean continent, which I had to breach in mission number 10. Score-based yet again, and my god, this one took ages. 20 minutes! I was flying around in circles and destroying random things for 20 minutes. At least they spice it up a little by having you dodge some incoming fire from Stonehenge every once in a while. Uh, where I can see them. There we go. Oh no, oh no, wait, 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 wait. Okay, well, I had so much time to react to this. The very fittingly named Escort mission had me protect two civilian airliners that transported Stonehenge engineers as they were trying to defect to an allied state. 
While this was a fairly short task, it stuck out to me a little more while editing this video, as I heard a somewhat familiar name pop up during one of the radio transmissions. This is gonna make more sense in the next video of the series. Mission number 12 is a big one. The name Stonehenge Offensive says it all. I had finally arrived at the source of trouble, which came close to taking me out multiple times. The mission also proved to be a very tough one, as I had to restart a couple of times. That's not gonna work. Oh no, it worked. Taking out the individual rail cannons was already somewhat of a challenge, but to add insult to injury, I was also hunted down by the Yellow Squadron once I did manage to destroy the super weapon. Thankfully, I only had to take out one of them before they retreated, so it wasn't as bad as I had initially thought. Ah, right, oh, come on! Oh, okay, that was good. This specific mission is incredibly important in turning the tide of the war, in more ways than just one. At this point in the story, it became clear that I, Mobius One, have started to become somewhat of a superstar. The cutscene that followed after the Stonehenge Offensive showed Yellow 13, a legend in his own right, acknowledge my skill as a pilot, while also mourning the loss of his squad mate as a result of that mission. It wouldn't really be an understatement to say that the player is basically solely responsible for the success that ISAF is seeing in this initially losing war that they were fighting. My involvement is the reason why we are winning. I am not joking. Pretty much all of the Allied pilots that have joined the missions were completely useless. It was completely up to me whether or not the mission would be a success. I single-handedly turned the tide of this goddamn war. And according to the wiki, it's canon, so... Don't at me. But I am getting a little ahead of myself here. We still have some things left to do before I could live out the rest of my days at some resort at a beautiful beach surrounded by women. Safe Return was an interesting mission. I basically had to slowly fly around while taking out airship mounted noise jammers while escorting back a spy plane from the enemy territory. Of course, I also had some ruffians try and hunt me down afterwards, but they just weren't ready for a fight with a legend like me. Breaking arrows had me fly over a frigid wasteland, chasing after cruise missiles that were headed straight for some of our allied forces. A short but pretty sweet mission that I probably enjoyed more than I should have. By mission 15, named Emancipation, we had advanced far enough into the enemy territory that it was finally time to reclaim one of the first cities that had been lost to Eruja when they first initiated their invasion. Fairly long and score-based yet again, and I don't really have much to say about this one. Except that we had some nutcases try and just level this whole place towards the end of the mission. Uh, thankfully, I was able to shoot them down before they could do any real damage. Oh, update. And just because this over 10 minute mission isn't enough, how about another 20 minute long score based one? Woohoo! <laughs> Uh, titled Whiskey Corridor, this was the last large-scale effort of the Erujans to halt our advancements towards their capital. I wonder how this mission would look like if I just sped up the entire thing into a couple of seconds? And with mission number 17, we had finally arrived at our enemy's doorstep. The Siege of Ferbanti was upon us, and occupying the Erujan capital city would surely put an end to this war. Our combined ground and air forces fought valiantly against the city's defenses, with me leading the charge after showing everyone how it's done. The one-man army was finally so close to achieving his goal, and nothing was going to stop him. Unless, of course, Eruja's own hero would rise up to the task of taking me down. Man, my brain is starting to turn a mush. Yeah, I need to. All right, we need a uh, we need a resupply. Oh, and it's all of them. Oh, I just like unleashed a hell barrage of missiles. Perfect. Well, maybe not perfect, but very good. 
Mobius One shot down the five aircraft that appeared. Air superiority is ours. You made it through alive, Mobius One. In the end, it was no use. No matter what the remaining Erujian troops tried to do, Mobius One was there to take them down. As we were finishing up the invasion on the capital, everyone could feel this war finally coming to a close. Yellow 13, the shadow that had been haunting us for all this time, was defeated, and I became the undisputed king of the skies. Maybe, deep down, this was what Yellow 13 wanted all along. An equal and a rival. Because after all, it is very lonely being at the top. So, um... Ace Combat 4, good game. The refinements on the gameplay side of things as well as the strong world building and grandness of the story made this a really great experience. I distinctly remember thinking to myself that if this is supposed to be the weakest game in the Holy Trinity, I was in for a treat once I got to the other ones. I didn't really feel the need to describe and explain every single little detail, however, as I think that AC4 is just a natural expansion of the lessons they have learned making the three previous games, and its systems built on top of that foundation. It wasn't as daring as AC3, but it steered the series in a direction that made sense to me, and I ended up really enjoying it. A little spoiler for the next video about Ace Combat 5, I plan to structure it in a little bit of a different way as that game is very special, so look forward to that. Whoa, 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 wait, wait, what is, what, what is this? A group of young Erujian officers have taken over Megalith, the super mm. weapon that was under development. Megalith is a rocket launch facility that can shoot down asteroid fragments in orbit. The only oh. way to destroy this highly dangerous and fortified facility is to hit it from the inside. Oh no. While I was busy taking over the capital, a new danger had appeared. I had one last task to complete, but I'm sure that we all know how this is going to go. Oh my god. Okay, we got one. Oh, what? Oh, sh... They're on their way. If I f*** this up, there will be hell to pay. Oh no! Oh no! Yo, wh wh where are the music guys? Come on. This would be so much, so, so much more epic. Sure did. And now we have finally actually arrived at the end of the game and the video. Like I've said, this game was a blast and I couldn't wait to check out AC5, which seemed to be most people's favorite. If you don't want to wait another month or so for the next video on this, uh, you can go back and watch my live playthrough VOD in the live stream section of the channel. I will also link it down below. And while you're at it, you should also consider becoming a channel member, as you get exclusive perks like emotes for live streams and even extra videos. Here's a quick sample of that. You first get to make your character carefully sculpted after your most favorite vampire from any media franchise out there, to then rise out of your crypt and start farming materials. Thanks to everyone who has been supporting me this way. You guys are the best and I can't thank you enough. But that's gonna be it for me for now. I really hope that you enjoyed it, and I will see you in the next one.
we have to quickly address something. Do you say Ghibli or Ghibli? Ghibli. 